Good evening, everyone, both here and via YouTube. Welcome to the first session of the Carl Jesper Society of North America uh, in conjunction with the 92nd uh, APA meeting. We've got six speakers here tonight talking about truth, communication, and free speech, Jespers in the university. So without further ado, then, I'd like to present our first speaker, Sanam Sanar, speaking on nothingness and finitude, exploring existentialist themes with children. So hello, uh, I'm going to start by describing a session I had uh, with children at the library and then connect it to Jaspers and his idea of a university. Um, if you're trying to do nothing, then you're not doing nothing because trying is doing something, said the 10-year-old girl after our short thought experiment at Beale Library at Bakersfield where I challenged the participants to do absolutely nothing for 30 seconds. Some children were perfectly still, some closed their eyelids, that time none of them tried to hold their breaths, but that has been tried by a few in other sessions. The story we read, Tim Egan's Pink Refrigerator, is about a rat called Dodsworth who likes to do nothing. He owns a thrift shop where he sells his daily finds from the junkyard. He watches TV and eats cheese sandwiches, and his motto in life is to do as little as possible until he comes across a pink refrigerator that commands him to read books, to make art, to play music, and gives him the adequate means to fulfill these tasks. Dodsworth's life is changed forever. In Philosophy for Children sessions where I have used this book, children wonder what the sentence Dodsworth, Dodsworth likes to do nothing means. They test whether doing nothing is possible. They try to come up with examples to understand what counts as doing something. They sometimes begin to think about the nature of agency, distinguishing between voluntary and involuntary motions. They question whether education and learning are valuable and why. And finally, they debate whether Dodsworth's life is better after he meets the refrigerator. Children love getting a chance to think and converse about the concept of nothingness, what doing nothing means, what doing something entails, and how we decide to do the things we do. As facilitator, I echo their statements, I compare their insights, and sometimes ask follow-up questions, but I mostly let the children direct the course of conversation and take stock of the reasons and implications of their claims and positions. In these sessions at the public libraries, all children between the ages 5 to 12 are welcome, and the only rule is that we listen to each other respectfully. Jasper's ideal of a university includes two key elements. One, Universities are institutions that house research and scholarship as ways, quote, in which truth becomes meaningful and manifest. And two, communication constitutes, quote, the living core of university life. As an institution devoted to the search for tru truth through communication, a university requires not only academics that uphold and practice these values, but also students that are open and able to collectively take on critical free inquiry both in its orientation to truth and its execution through communication. I argue that such desire as well as capacity for participation in the university's mandate must be cultivated in students at an early age. Being oriented towards free inquiry requires that economic and instrumental considerations for education do not exhaust the student's reasons for seeking a university education. And such a desire for truth for its own sake is best cultivated by retaining children's natural curiosity about big questions, such as the beginning of the universe, identity, meaning of life, nature of friendship, or concept of nothing. The capacity for participation in a community of learning and research requires that the virtues of open debate, intellectual empathy, and responsible intellectual conversation are familiar to students that their relation to their superiors are not rigidly defined as submission to authority figures and disciplinarians, but also as fellow inquirers and thinkers. I argue that these two goals of a university, the open inquiry for truth and communication as the method for such inquiry, are best supported if philosophical thinking is introduced to students at an early age. My talk today will thus take the form of an exhortation for philosophy departments, especially those that find Jasper's vision meaningful and desirable, to include philosophy for children programs as part of their community outreach. This is already an ongoing practice in universities. In engaging children in philosophical dialogue, these programs aim to foster a community of inquiry 
as part of a community of thinkers, pondering big questions together and sharing their views with one another, children practice important skills, such as critical thinking, oral communication, and intellectual empathy. In these conversations, children, one, think about and take a position regarding an open-ended philosophical question, two, clearly articulate their positions, three, provide reasons for their positions, four, listen charitably to understand each other, and consider whether they agree or disagree with others' answers. They verbally express such agreement or disagreement in a respectful manner. And finally, evaluate together diverse positions and insights. What I'd like to report on is specifically as a relatively novel undertaking, is offering a philosophy for children sessions at public universities. Public libraries, I find, sorry, not public universities, but public libraries. Public libraries provide a venue that is open to all often and especially to those who have the least access to such intellectual or educational resources in general. Children hear for the first time the word philosophy and come to associate it with a free and open exchange of ideas where the aim is not to find a final answer to a question but rather gain a better understanding of the question and canvas the field of possible answers to it. Bringing the word and practice of philosophy to children's world introduces open and critical and communal inquiry as a desirable and essential virtue in their lives. This not only inoculates them against conformist and stifling ways of schooling as well as tradition, but also prepares them to become ready and willing participants in the Socratic dialogue Jaspers argues we should foster in universities. The ideals of higher education we share in the humanities, such as holistic search for truth, ideal of a communicative rationality, the need to combine theory and practice, such that education is geared toward the whole person, are ones that Jaspers emphasizes in his 1946 book, The Idea of the University. But we live in a time where the university is increasingly becoming driven by professional and vocational concerns rather than such haughty ideals as the search for truth. While it is also the case that those very professions our students seek for vocational concerns are under threat of becoming obsolete with the rapid progress in technology. I pose two distinct but related questions regarding the role of the university in public life. One, can the freedom of thinking, the kind which Jaspers believes a university should exemplify and generate, be achieved by mature students, adults in universities, if it has already been trained out of them when they were children or has not been sufficiently cultivated? Two, is the idea of public philosophy compatible with the existentialist emphasis on individuality and the normative goal of an authentic life? How is one to retain authentic communication and individual integrity of thinking if one opens such thinking to the public and to children who are not yet mature, responsible thinkers? I argue that involving children in democratic education through a community of philosophical inquiry prepares them to become both free-thinking adults, that is, future university students who can fully participate in the Socratic inquiry, Jaspers and Visions, as constituting the mandate of higher education, and secondly, cultivates an authentic mode of being with others from an early age, which makes possible a freer individual development. So my first point, point first. We need to sustain children's natural curiosity about questions that matter questions that have a stake in their lives for them to become participants in Socratic inquiry in the university. And I was surprised to find that Jaspers actually addresses this in his uh, book, Way to Wisdom, An Introduction to Philosophy, which is actually a transcript of 12 radio lectures Jaspers gave in 1950. And this is a few decades before philosophy for children was started in the United States. Um, Jaspers addresses in these lectures the natural curiosity of children and points out that in children we find what he calls a spontaneous philosophy. He says that one finds in the questions asked by children a marvelous indication of man's innate disposition to philosophy and gives a few examples of such questions. A child cries out in wonderment, this is quotation from Jaspers, I keep trying to think that I'm somebody else, but I'm always myself. Jaspers comments that the child has come to realize one of the universal sources of certainty, awareness of being through awareness of self. The child, Jaspers says, is perplexed at the mystery of his eye, this mystery that can be apprehended through nothing else. He then talks about a boy who is asking about, you know, what's before the beginning. Is there any end to going, you know, to the 
originary causes, right? And then he um, recites another conversation about certainty through experience. Jaspers concludes his reflection on children's natural propensity to philosophical insights and philosophical questioning by addressing a possible objection. He admits that, and I quote here from Jaspers, it is sometimes said that the children must have heard all this from their parents or someone else, but such an objection obviously does not apply to the child's really serious questions. To argue that these children do not continue to philosophize and that consequently such utterances must be accidental is to overlook the fact that children often possess gifts which they lose as they grow up. With the years, and I think I find this very um, pertinent, with the years we seem to enter into a prison of conventions and opinions, concealments and unquestioned acceptance, and there we lose the candor of childhood. Jaspers here complains that because children themselves forget these insights and questions and cease to engage in such curiosity, we tend to ignore their unique interest and capacity. What is most relevant for my argument is Jaspers' point that the process of growing up is one of entering into a prison of conventions and opinions, concealments and unquestioned acceptance. How can we resist or rectify this pattern? How can we keep alive the spontaneous philosophical attitude of children well into adulthood, or at least until their university years? But there is another challenge to this idyllic picture of childhood. Are children capable of learning through Socratic inquiry? Is such inquiry best fitted to adults we have, who have had the necessary training in basic disciplinary knowledge? While he speaks so highly of the natural philosophical attitude of children, Jasper seems to also limit the viability of such an education to adult students. In discussing Socratic inquiry in his 1946 book, The Idea of the University, Jaspers notes that, and this is a quotation from him, education at a university is Socratic by its very nature. It is not like the instruction one receives in high school. University students are adults, not children. They are mature, have full responsibility for themselves. Professors do not give them assignments or personal guidance. Freedom, the all-important factor, is irreconcilable with even so impressive a training as that which has been traditionally identified with the monastic orders and military academies. This type of submission to rigid training and leadership keeps the individual from experiencing a genuine will to know, and it blocks the development of human independence. My question that I'd like to pose both to Jaspers and ourselves tonight is whether such a freedom of thinking can be achieved by mature students, by adults in universities, if it has already been trained out of them when they were children. In our educational systems, it seems as if we're working for goals that are at cross purposes with one another. While we encourage children to be excellent rule followers and execute the training we give them, we do not leave them much opportunity or reason for questioning. We do that since, as Jasper seems to be implying, um, we take it that they are not yet mature adults responsible for their way of being. While we train them for a predominantly passive model of learning, we later expect them to become, or wish they were, partners in Socratic dialogue once they reach university education, as Jaspers recommends. And we may scorn or complain when they are not up for such critical reflection and engagement with ideas when they are mature adults. Jaspers argues that the idea of the university requires the op open mind, the readiness to relate oneself to things with the aim of getting at a picture of the whole in terms of one's special discipline. The ideal requires that there be communication, not only an interdisciplinary, but also on an interpersonal level. A university's search for truth is based on free and open communication. Universities are valuable institutions for getting at truth precisely due to their capacity to provide a venue for interdisciplinary conversation, which allows disciplines to make note of each other's blind spots, unwarranted assumptions, as well as points of contact and collaboration. Truth is an ongoing project where these contributions from disciplines and individuals are both corrective and collaborative. And truth, if it is truth, will have its expressions in myriad areas and disciplines. Thus, especially given that communication for Jaspers is the way to truth, and it is the living core of university life, it follows that communication should be fostered as a virtue and goal in children from early on. 
Which brings me to my second point, that such communication can only be fostered through actually practicing it, which I will argue is a strong point of philosophy for children programs that aim at building a community of inquiry among the children. So my second point, and I'll keep this short so we can have a conversation, it is not enough to merely encourage or sustain children's natural curiosity. We must make sure that the traditional upbringing, both the familial and cultural framework, as well as schooling, does not form rigid forms of being with others and foreclose emancipating communication. Um, Jaspers talks about the, the importance of tradition and upbringing and acknowledges that without tradition, there is no substance to learning. But we must add that without critical dialogue, there is no method to test and improve tradition, once given beliefs and values. If children's predominant mode of encountering others, of examples of communication, is that of conformity and submission, of adoption of acceptable ways of pursuing life choices, which is a mode of training rather than understanding, how will they achieve the type of freedom required for Socratic inquiry when they become adult students in the university? Encountering early on philosophical questioning that has an existential import allows children to address issues that matter to them, issues that are part of their daily lives, issues which generally are not part of the curriculum and thus most often get shelved or prematurely resolved. Participating in a community of inquiry gives them a venue to raise and address these issues. They come to value reaching an understanding and see truth as a process and project, not reducible to memorizable bits. Thus, doing philosophy with, chil with children brings the value of critical dialogue and renders it imminent to their tradition and schooling. That is, it incorporates it to the very upbringing of children. The openness and desire for inquiry that Jaspers finds in children is thus cultivated rather than stifled. To question and reflect is not treated as a technique to be learned in a critical thinking class, but is second nature. A community of inquiry values and practices critical thinking as an imminent development of thinking and communication. Children will not accept principles or claims as given or on authority, but they will develop both the principles of conversation as well as their content of opinions through a process of dialogic interaction. Since the gains are self-derived, that is, the understanding is collectively achieved, the results stay with the children. And while such conversation may be vulnerable to mistakes in reasoning, self-correction is possible through continued interaction, and minimally, the method of collective inquiry and truth as process is affirmed and defended in this activity. So Jasper's book, The Idea of, a, of the University, begins with the claim, the university is a community of scholars and students engaged in the task of seeking the truth. And I believe that such a uh, community is made possible by um, fostering the natural curiosity of children rather than stifling it. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam. So next up, we have uh, Max Spotstein talking about the idea of the university in practice, Carl Jaspers, Heinrich Bluter, and the common course at Bard College. Uh, thank you. And uh, this is somewhat more of a historical paper, but I hope that it uh, has more than just an antiquarian interest uh, for you here. Um, so Carl Jaspers made uh, higher education reform one of the defining causes of his career. The first book he published after the end of the war, begun scarcely a month after the liberation of Heidelberg, was a revision of his text, The Idea of the University, in which he described his vision of a reformed university system. The university, as Jaspers understood it, was essential to the future of a healthy and democratic society. Yet although Jaspers was among the most famous European philosophers of his day, his vision for the university has never been regarded as having been very influential for the development of higher education in the post-war period. Jaspers' ideal, a small education system designed for an intellectual aristocracy, still bound by the unity of the sciences and without grades, course syllabi, or specific vocational training, bears little resemblance to what actually emerged in the Federal Republic or, truthfully, anywhere else. Indeed, Jaspers' program seemed to many to be out of touch with and perhaps even hostile to modern values. When we discuss Jaspers' work, we hardly ever engage with his practical suggestions for concerning pedagogy, and it is difficult for us to imagine a course of study built on Jaspers' foundations. 
And yet, on the other side of the Atlantic, a man named Heinrich Blücher, known to most as the husband of Hannah, Hannah Arendt, Jasper's most famous student, made a serious attempt to create precisely this sort of program. In this paper, I intend to describe Blücher's experiment, centered around a curriculum very similar to Jaspers' own writings on the university and on the history of philosophy. This program was the common course at Bard College, which began in 1953 and continued under Blücher's direction until 1968. Blücher and Jaspers recognized the kinship between their goals, even though the two men never met. Jaspers once wrote to Arendt, if only Heinrich and I could get together now and then. He is in the thick of bringing about educational reform on a practical level. My involvement is only theoretical. I propose that we look at Blücher's Common Course as both a significant example of the reception of Jaspers' university idea among the intellectuals of his day, and also as a window into a hitherto overlooked aspect of Jaspers' relationship with Arendt. I also want to suggest that by looking at Blücher's project, we can glimpse what kinds of compromises in Jaspers' programs might be acceptable while still retaining the core of his educational mission. Blücher himself is a rather enigmatic figure. Born in 1899 in Berlin, he was drafted into the army in 1917, and although he later studied at university, he never received an academic degree. He claimed to have fought in the streets in the Spartacist uprising and spent most of the 20s as a newspaper reporter and a communist organizer before fleeing Germany in 1933 for Paris, where he met Arendt. Apart from a few book reviews, he published almost nothing in his entire life although that has not prevented anyone from attributing all sorts of insights in his wife's work to him. What we do have is an extensive series of lecture plans, recordings, and transcripts, all made by devoted students, although none of the several attempts to publish his writings after his death have borne any fruit. The bulk of these lectures come from the common course he developed at Bard. The course was meant to be a freewheeling and interdisciplinary series of lectures exploring, in Blücher's words, a whole series of questions dealing with major issues in man's varied activities and interests that is, his political, economic, and social aims, and the institutions he had devised to further those aims. The, question, the questions addressed, of course, were philosophical, in the sense that Jaspers understood the term, in that their study could yield no objective truths. And thus, these questions were ones, Blücher asserted, for which we know no ultimate answers. What makes the Common Course so interesting to us here is that in form, it rests on the foundations of university. And in content, it closely follows his writings in The Origin and Goal of History and The Great Philosophers. Jaspers believed, above all, that higher education was not principally intended to impart factual information. This was the purpose of secondary schools. Instead, the university offered a place free from the demands of pure utility, in which an individual might find fulfillment in truth. The university itself arose from the essential human desire for truth, and as such, it was opposed to all forms of philosophical, political, or religious dogmatism. Education was intended, in Jaspers' terms, to be Socratic rather than scholastic, in that the student and teacher met as equal seekers of truth. Jaspers emphasized that total freedom of study without regard for grades or course requirements was necessary as well, as only that freedom helped students understand the unity of the sciences and prevented the university from becoming, in his words, an intellectual department store. Nevertheless, despite its separation from instrumental concerns, and in a way because of this, the university played an important social function. It taught one to pose questions and provided an, an introduction to the methods by which answers could be sought. As Jaspers put it, the university prepares each member, each individual to be a member of society. Blücher's course was, des was designed with this mission in mind, although it deviated in some respects from the ideal model. Jaspers' plan was a comprehensive scheme for university education as a whole, and his writings make it clear that student choice was extremely important. Yet the mandate Blücher received from Bard was for a required course for freshmen. Nevertheless, he tried as much as he could to frame the project in Jaspersian terms, if, if that's a word. Blücher saw his role not so much as a teacher of timeless truths, but as a guide and fellow explorer. The kind of temperament Blücher sought to inculcate, what Jaspers called the scientific attitude, could not be taught. The task of becoming free men and women could only be a self-directed project that lasted a lifetime. Blücher told incoming students, quote, your teachers will start you on this task, show it to you as more experienced collaborators, join and help you, because we ourselves are still in it. He explicitly likened his role to that of Socrates and reminded his listeners that Socrates, quote, 
never had students because he called them his companions and enjoined them to view him in the same light. Barr did require that Blücher submit grades, but he made every effort to lessen their importance in the eyes of his students. If they ever felt unjustly graded, he said, they should attribute it to his own ignorance, for he was still an igno ignorant man. What Blücher hoped to do with the common course was to clarify the relationship between the various expressions of human knowledge and creativity, science, art, religion, ethics, politics, etc., and the faculty of free philosophical reasoning. Philosophy, in Blücher's account, united and gave meaning to the other kinds of creative thinking and feeling. In particular, as in Jaspers' own university idea, philosophy elucidated and balanced the role of science. Both thinkers thaw, saw science, in a narrow sense, as reducible to a sense of method, a rational and self-critical process. It could return truths of universal validity, yet it did not elucidate being. Philosophy, by contrast, did not yield provable or universal truths, but could awaken an awareness of being. Philosophy limited the pretensions of science, and science that of philosophy. Neither was complete without the other. Philosophy, Blücher felt, was necessary to understand and establish the limits of creative faculties. In this respect, every human being required philosophy, for only philosophy provided the framework with which to understand being. This was the formulation he suggested to Jaspers, who replied, enth who replied enthusiastically. Jaspers declared that he was, quote, especially pleased that you, Blücher, could agree without any reservations on the distinction between science and philosophy. Blücher took pains to define his capacious vision of philosophy in opposition to bad or dogmatic philosophy, which he called metaphysics, and which he claimed robbed philosophy of its creative power and emancipatory potential. He believed that Western philosophy since Plato came dangerously close to a specious belief in absolute truth that led either to intellectual fanaticism or nihilism. Without a solid grounding for understanding being, Humans suffered a loss of individuality, and the rise of totalitarian movements that offered a sense of refuge from aimlessness was the fatal result. In order to restore philosophical education to its foundations and prepare his students for their future specialized studies, Blücher designed the course to center on a period in the history of humanity in which human thought passed from one paradigm to another. Blücher believed that the present represented another such moment in which old convictions were crumbling and new ones must be found. He structured his course around a, a discussion of nine important figures in the history of philosophy who had participated in the last great liminal period, as their example might help us with our own predicament. The philosophical shift Blücher described was, of course, almost identical to Jasper's theory of the axial age, while the figures he chose were almost the same ones as Jasper's was at the very same time considering as part of a series on the great philosophers. Jaspers told Blücher that the basic idea seems similar for both of us, although some of the names of the figures were not the same. For Blücher, what was crucial about this great transformation in thought was that it marked the end of the mythical age. According to Blücher, mythology is the immediate reaction to man's fear when he is first confronted with being. He uses magic to rid himself of reality altogether. Mythical thought turned reality into a shapeless mass because myth made no distinctions between subject and object, creator and created. Myth related everything to every other thing by means of metaphor and thus could comprehend and encompass everything, binding humanity in a speculative world that was infinitely malleable but infinitely static. According to Blücher, the deceptive metaphors of myth obscured the truth of being and trapped the human mind, quote, in an real fictional world. The great flaw of myth was that it was not in itself fully creative. It had no capacity to change the world. In emphasizing myth, Blücher was drawing out an element of Jaspers' axial theory that is not always fully emphasized. Jaspers also believed that the period preceding the axial age was the mythical age, an era of, quote, tranquility and self-evidence, in which mankind understood existence in terms of mythical images. The axial age, in contrast, represented the triumph of rationality and rati rationally clarified experience, logos against mythos. Humans gained awareness of their own subjectivity and achieved a new level of historical consciousness and self-reflection, what Jaspers char characterized as the recognition of being as a whole. Blücher's thought echoes Jaspers in other peculiar ways as well. 
He appears to have come to the conclusion that the trends of development in Indian and Chinese philosophy paralleled those of Greek philosophy independently. Just as China had become almost a second homeland for Jaspers, it had fulfilled much the same role for Blücher during the war, when that philosophy seemed to offer both thinkers help in, quote, reflecting on the very basic elements of human life during that dark period. Again and again, there are strange and compelling parallels in the intellectual project of Blücher's and Jaspers. The former is clearly a disciple of the latter, who recognized in him a kindred spirit when it came to the importance of a specific type of uh, education, and particularly philosophical education. When Blücher was considering retirement, Jaspers wrote to Arendt, saying, his teaching must not stop, he is irreplaceable. Blücher's colleagues at Bard believed so as well. He impressed everyone he met, and he became a fixture of the institution, overseeing the common course for 15 years. Visiting faculty, including Saul Bellow and others, hailed him as a genius. He exercised tremendous influence on his students, as attested by their repeated attempts to publish his course lectures posthumously. All this strongly suggests that although Jaspers' program for education has often been discounted as hopelessly impractical, it may not, after all, be impossible. If Blücher was able to successfully run the common course, it proved a fortiori that approaching Jaspers' texts as real roadmaps of pedagogical method, as they were intended to be, is hardly a fool's errand. That is no small revelation, especially in our times, when the concern shared by Jaspers and Blücher about the problems inherent in technical education divorced from the philosophical awareness of human existence and the limits of science seem increasingly urgent. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, so we'll have one more speaker and then open it up for about uh, 15 minutes of Q&A. So next we have Steven Erickson speaking on the university and civil society, the challenges of free communication. In what follows, I understand myself in somewhat the role cast by John Locke for those he termed uh, under laborers. Their task was to clear underbrush so that the real work could more successfully begin. We can think of freedom in broadly cognitive settings as either freedom of expression or freedom to pursue the truth, wherever it might lead. The former is typically labeled freedom of speech. In our country, the United States, it is protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. It is a right. The latter is labeled academic freedom, the opportunity to undertake an unfettered search for truth regardless of truth's consequences. This form of freedom is also construed as a right but even more so as a responsibility. Now a few and some basic words about listening, a topic not that often taken up, but indeed of further discussion in recent times. One does not always have the right to listen. There are laws protecting certain kinds of communications, privileged communications as they are called, doctor-patient being one. Overlapping these are laws protecting privacy more generally, and certain sorts of intrusions onto such privacy can be legally prosecuted. There are also confidentiality contracts. Public, not private settings and circumstances are another matter. Semantically, and thus conceptually, the public and the private, of course, differ. And there are gradations of publicness ranging at least from city parks to auditoriums on privately endowed college campuses. Generally speaking, does one have the right to listen to what is being said in such settings? It is hard not to respond, yes. But does one have the right to attend in the first place? This may depend on such things as membership status, the cost, if any, of tickets, seating availability, and the conditions of admittance is provided by prior announcements, invitations, advertisements, and promotions issued by a sponsoring group. Matters, as one might have expected, now become somewhat more contentious, and not just because of disagreements regarding various people's rights to enter into variously defined public spaces. Consider the following question. Assuming that the right to listen is underwritten, thus sanctioned and made operative to, through the right to attend, 
does anyone have the countervailing oppositional right? Itself then also a basis and justification of free speech if acknowledged to interfere with and thus prevent such listening from successfully taking place. In short, can one legitimately shout speakers down? In the sort of settings and circumstances now under consideration, it would appear to be a prohibitively steep hill to climb, at the top of which would be found the right for some the obligation to prevent officially sanctioned and sponsored communication from occurring successfully. To do so would be of a piece with disrupting free speech itself, though paradoxically in the name of free speech. After all, isn't the concept of free speech performative? That is, can free speech be free if no one is able to hear it in a manner that enables its comprehension? And surely the same sorts of reflections would apply and be valid, not just of free speech, but of academic freedom as well, the pursuit of truth wherever it might lead, now also construed as taking place in sanctioned and sponsored locales in public educational settings. Carl Jaspers, as we know, insisted and is the idea of the university that it is the task of a community of scholars and students to be engaged in the seeking of such truth. And he saw institutions such as universities as prime places for this activity, this enterprise and undertaking. Unfortunately, however, as we well know, it is not as quick and easy as I have made it out to be, and mostly for two reasons, though there are others. One reason involves the distinction between a public place in the sense of a space in which a public may gather, a city park, for example, or a public beach, and a legitimately private place wherein a particular grouping of diverse people, a then particular public, might under certain conditions be allowed to enter and participate. Worrisomely, it looks as if the former sort of place, the city park, is less amenable to justifiable control, if by this is meant the legitimized prevention or closing down of attempted disruptions of free communication. However annoying and frustrating it so often is, unless shouting reaches the level of disturbing the peace or comes up against noise abatement and or hate crime considerations, there may be nothing at all that can effectively be done. This is just one of the consequences, the manifestations of a robust, messy, and often contentious democracy at work, even and especially perhaps apparent in various sports stadiums, themselves often privately owned, but open to the public through ticket purchases and other procedural mechanisms. After all, the home crowd often tries to prevent the visiting team from hearing the calling of its own signals on the field. And are there actually any attempts to prevent this from occurring? The other cause for concern arises out of historical circumstances, quite possibly even probably our historical circumstances. What I have sketched to this point has incorporated in a rough and ready way reasonable thinking regarding free speech and academic freedom. Here again, we should take note of Jaspers, who believe that a university should always remain committed to providing a space for free intellectual communication, even at the sacrifice of allowing those with less tolerant views to speak a university environment she would feel confident enough to allow such views. But such a sketch is most, and some might say only reasonable, some might even say only helpful, in normal and thus stable times. In such times there is large scale, though by no means universal agreement regarding the rules of civil engagement. There are also consensually accepted algorithms regarding decision procedures for resolving disputes, whether over rules or rulings. There is a sufficient degree of transparency to enable somewhat harmonious 
and collegial investigations of opaque areas and vague boundaries. Although we must not idealize these conditions, transforming them into the way things surely never quite were, nonetheless, if only as a regulative principle, I do think that we understand what we were talking about when we talk in this way. We do have a clear conceptual vision of so-called normal times. What might come into play in abnormal, meaning transitional times, however, is quite another matter. What the rules of engagement will turn out to be and what the decision procedures will come to be for overcoming civil logjams, potential conflicts or chaos, and seemingly irreconcilable because starkly opposing agendas are themselves very much and often altogether in contention and there proves to be little, if any, accepted common ground or grid, thus no meta-level through whose platform resolutions can be effectively developed, conveyed, and acknowledged. For most of our historical period, a period often severely challenged and damaged, though nonetheless impressively resilient and robust, the rules of the game and so-called advanced and advancing democracies have largely been consensually accepted. We have often labeled this historical period the Enlightenment period, and we have lived largely in the protection of its lengthy wake. Transitions, prolonged or abrupt, invariably problematic and often frightening and destructive, have irregularly but frequently occurred in our historical past. There has never been a longevity, much less a guarantee of permanence, for any era, and thus neither for our own. In this respect, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, and in particular ways its freedom and terror chapter, have provided an instructive template for what has happened in the past and could easily become a window upon our pending future perhaps even our emerging present. Let me consider another portion of my remarks, this portion with a brief and hopefully helpful, if somewhat unsettling, set of reminders. Free speech and academic freedom, civil society and the university are historical realities embodying normative notions. Such realities are rule-guided, and subject to strategies of upheaval and attempts at radical restructuring in abnormal times, that is to say, transitional ones. What are more or less pervasively understood to be valid distinctions and altogether cogent, thus appropriate regulative procedures can come to be impinged upon, derided, attacked, and overthrown. What outcomes might then be expected as a consequence of such extraordinary historical conditions? We can, in fact, only surmise, but I believe that at least one thing can be counted on. If, after historical abnormality gives away and a new normal takes its place, it is likely to be some time before its outlines come into full focus. A new Supposed normal would surely involve the emergence of essentially new lenses for observation and evaluation, and most likely there would be significant consequences for what freedom, truth, and communication would then come to mean. It is perhaps instructive to ponder the illustrious Greeks of ancient times. Let us remember that they really had no notion of will, as in free will which is by no means to suggest that they could not and did not engage in unconstrained actions. Nonetheless, their experience of themselves and their world was quite different than ours, and theirs to this day remains less than fully transparent to us as would ours to them. Many other examples of this sort, some striking, more striking than others, could also be mentioned. To forward this perspective and quandary in a complementary way, consider institutions. If institutions embed, contextualize, and thereby structure and inform 
human identity in fundamental ways, and we grant that such institutions are historical in nature, arriving on the scene, lingering for an indeterminate time, and then departing, it is hard not to conclude that even civil societies and universities, as we have known them, may morph in material enough ways as to make a number of questions we ask regarding them problematic. In the interest of a more complete disclosure, I should conclude by stating that the views I have mentioned and ever so blur uh, briefly explored are somewhat foreign to me, but I do believe they deserve consideration for one aspect of academic freedom at least must be the good faith effort to provide a charitable account of an opposing way of construing various core matters that are in dispute. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, <clears throat> so we'll open it up now for uh, some Q&A. Uh, anybody in the audience, if you'd like to come up and speak, we have a chair here and we'll just give you the mic. It's a quick question for you, Max. Um, I thought the, uh, the connection you drew between Jaspers and, and Bluchner was, was very interesting. It's not one that I knew about. So what I was interested to know is, um, on the one hand, what was considered so interesting about his lectures that, that people were trying to publish them? B, what was so difficult about publishing his le uh, lectures that it wasn't able to happen? And um, C, if you were familiar of the content of those lectures, was there any explicit description or, or engagement with the concept of the axial age uh, as Jaspers had articulated it in his, his own work? So the, the first question is, is why so interesting? Um, and that's, I mean, that's very difficult. To, there actually are recordings um, that, that exist of his lectures. Um, and, and he has this sort of very, he's a great talker with this like very thick German accent. Um, there's actually even a, a Romana Clay uh, by uh, Randall Jarrett, I think, Gerald maybe, uh, pictures from an institution in which a, a, a sort of a, a figure that is clearly modeled off of uh, Blue figures that are modeled after Blue Rent and appear, and, and, and Jared gives a, or Gerald, I forget which, gives a sort of an account of, of just how captivating and, and why uh, captivating this, this, this figure is. Um, I, I think he just was a great talker. Uh, the, the reason why they were not published, so first, uh, it's, it's, they're a little bit difficult. They'd have to be edited, um, that they were pretty much extemporaneously delivered. So they're very choppy with a lot of, um, uh, you know, repetitions. And, and the more pressing problem is that you know, Arendt herself was interested in the project, but also was a little bit wary. Um, in the correspondence that deals with, with, with uh, the potential publication of, of Blücher's lectures, she, she's very clear in that she doesn't want this to be considered to be part of her own work. And I think that she had had some concerns, and given that, the difficulty of, 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 of compiling these sort of very freewheeling lecture notes over 15 years just made the, the project impossible. Um, and there was a third part of your question. What was that again? Is there any explicit mention of the Axial Age? Um, no, interestingly enough, uh, I haven't, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't find any explicit mention of the Axial Age, although there is, there's quite a, a, a good bit of mention of Jaspers, and, you know, Jaspers' texts were assigned, and then people discussed Jaspers. Um, but no, it's interesting just how, how similar the two concepts were. There isn't, it isn't, there's no explicit attribution, though. No. This can be a question that I think all of you can answer, considering the way it kind of fit in. So, Max, you said that it ended in 1968. So, and he, as depending on there, how riveted everyone was by this, what happens in 1968 that changes everything, or what happens at that point? And then now I'll kind of move this to uh, to you. Um, <clears throat> so. We need to recaptivate this natural curiosity. Uh, one way to think of that is, um, is philosophy dead? Which are some questions people ask. So like, can we get back to this point? Or, um, or is it just no way for us to even get there? How might we get there? And this kind of fits with, with uh, 
Steven Erickson's point too, because then he was saying, what might the institution be if it becomes something that's not even recognizable to us now, right? So kind of like the span of how, how do we get back if we can? This was a potential area of success, Vyasapur's ideas. What happened? And then of course in this sense, like if, if the university or the institution is going to be something we don't even recognize, what Right. What might that say kind of in reverse order back? I mean, what happens in 1968 is that Blücher retires. Um, and then I think within a year, he's, he's dead. I mean, he retires for health uh, reasons. Um, but I think, it, I think it is interesting that, that, this, that these ideas aren't you know, widely spread. It's really the sort of force of personality of a single individual. And it's interesting that given how Given how you know important Jaspers was uh, in the post-war period, especially in America, as the sort of you know among the the most important European philosophers, how had a little impact there impact there actually was of the university idea. Maybe a short comment. I don't I don't think philosophy dies by itself. I think um, we either actively you know contribute to its death, or we do not do anything. We're indifferent while you know it's being lost. And um, if, if we believe that there is something, like the, the Dasein is the kind of being that is concerned with the question of his being, if there is anything to that, that and that Socratic inquiry uh, is something that is valuable and essential to human existence, then uh, I believe, or at least I argued, that we have to uh, foster it from early on. This both the orientation to truth and communication as an activity uh, of its method, right? That we cannot just, you know, expect, oh, you know, you need to have a stake in your life, but after we've told them that they need jobs and for that they need to have skills. I should have phrased my question a little better. Yeah, just, yeah, I was wondering if, is it a, is it a pendulum swing and, and we've kind of moved away from, from philosophy and towards this technical training and questioning and all that kind of stuff, and it's, philosophy's just gone underground and it's, it's going to just, naturally surface back up or something like that. Maybe whether it's the pendulum seeing and you kind of seem to be answering that, but maybe clarifying my question might help. I think that the 1968s has something to do with the, the growing colonization of capitalism in our cultural mm -hmm. space. And uh, as we let that happen, this is just going to become more and more enhanced, I think. So um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I actually may interject, I mean, something that's interesting is if you, if, if any of you have read uh, uh, Wendy Brown's recent <laughs> book, Undoing the Demos, um, you know, about the sort of rise of what she calls uh, neoliberalism. She's a chapter on universities, and it's, it's actually striking how parallel the language she uses about the sort of instrument, instrumentalization of education in this, what she thinks of as this new uh, neoliberal university, you know, that emerged really in the, in the 70s and onwards. Uh, is very, very similar to uh, the kind of language uh, Jaspers, is used, is, Jaspers uses in the idea of the university when talking about technical education and, and the problems posed by that. I mean, that's just, it's, it's striking that there are those, those parallels are, are so clear. You mentioned uh, Jaspers' uh, insistence that tradition ultimately provides content to instruction mm -hmm. I mean, for children, and then you... Uh, also said that you know we need to critically evaluate critical thinking mm -hmm. is uh, i mean otherwise how will we mm -hmm. you know uh, become a creative as a as a society or as individuals mm -hmm. now in dealing with children how would you try to strike a balance between tradition on the one hand and socratic critical thinking on the other hand that's my question to you and then i you know request Max and Stephen to also com comment more generally that within a university, I mean, you know, how do we strike a balance between carrying out the tradition and then becoming creative? Thank you. The idea of honoring tradition does not have to um, counter critical inquiry necessarily. Um, I think even in traditions, uh, where we are prone to valuing philosophy. We do not want children to continue the ways of tradition just on authority. We, we want them to find value in 
meaning in those goals and content of tradition. And thus, uh, the, the way I, I um, kind of skipped uh, Jasper's comment here, he was talking about the Greek tradition and how if you if the child is trained in with the you know desire for excellence and uh, love of intellectual inquiry, that is going to be kind of in their genes <laughs> or something, and uh, that's that's the kind of uh, training that I would like to include to all tradition that that uh, wants to continue as a self-conscious tradition, right? Not uh, just on the order of its authority over children, but because it's, it's good to, <laughs> to adopt and, and um, value. It was Plutarch who insisted that we are all children of tradition. Mm -hmm. And even the critical tradition is a part of the tradition. Mm -hmm. so, so it depends on how we view tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that sense, uh, I mean, if, if you take that broad view of tradition, uh, then, uh, you know, how, how to, how to uh, inculcate a sense of tradition in that broad sense and at the same time uh, you know encourage students uh, particularly children to be to be critical thinkers there is an example there's a children's book um, that poses the question okay we're told uh, do not lie but we're also told to be kind to others but sometimes being kind to another requires that you do not tell the truth right and uh, if, if you are going to only follow directions, there are times in life that the directions will, will contradict and you need to make a choice. And this is the teaching of tradition. It doesn't give you recipes. It gives you orientations, right? But it doesn't solve all your problems. So in that sense, I, I believe that open inquiry will be good for any tradition. Of course, I mean, I, I know there are problems, <laughs> uh, but uh, any tradition that values, let's say, uh, philosophical questioning, and if there is a tradition that doesn't value it, then that tradition, I think, is, is bound to suffer uh, because it doesn't give meaning and value to its adherents. Once upon a time in my uh, early lifetime as a professor, the establishment was uh, very committed to something called Western civilization as the core of any uh, history or humanities program. And then there came to be attacks on it. And the attacks initially were viewed as misguided, wrongheaded, in some cases viewed as outrageous, uh, uh, not fully coherent, and not altogether useful. Well, then some sort of equilibrium happened in this power struggle. And on the outside of that, uh, we've kind of recalibrated things so that though there is to some degree, though far less so, some kind of a commitment also to teaching Western civilization, it's uh, no longer at least places I know a little about or where I teach altogether integral. So I think those sorts of things happening. And what I'm concerned to appreciate more than frankly I uh, often enough do is this idea that we go through periods where the grid of evaluation undergoes change. You know, you start with a grid against which anyone that opposed it, uh, some kind of misguided rebel. So that was Galileo once. Uh, he was going against an establishment that we now, in terms of educational fundamentals, uh, sort of let go of, or more than sort of let go of. And uh, my concern is just that we might be in a similar kind of problematic time for uh, determining what's core, what's marginal, what's going to be viewed as altogether significant, and what's going to be viewed as interesting but receding into history. Okay, uh, we will continue with the uh, second part of our session here. So first we'll have Dane Sawyer speaking on existence and nothingness, Jaspers and Sartre on the ontology of truth. So on the popular show Seinfeld, <clears throat> George Costanza memorably states to Jerry Seinfeld just before Jerry faces a lie detector test. He says, Jerry, just remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. <clears throat> and so the way I take this is that George's uh, sentiments signify this philosophical gray area between willful and necessary ignorance. So on the one hand, we could just simply can't know all there is to know, right? Our, our knowledge is limited. 
But yet we also know, on the other hand, that people purposely avert or deny or obfuscate the truth, possibly for their own economic, social, political gain, or sometimes simply as a psychological coping mechanism, right? a product of the desperate attempt or need to avoid uncomfortable, unsettling, or upsetting truths. So moreover, it's a troubling fact that our current polarized political climate is amplifying the murkiness surrounding truth. <clears throat> what is often true doesn't mark consciousness in general or embodiment of, of uh, the idea as an outpouring of spirit, as Jaspers argues but rather is sometimes what is labeled truth is frequently a mere means to draw political alliances, uh, reinforce uh, social tribalism, and manipulate the data or facts from one's own political or social agenda. So Jaspers, I think, rightly highlights the perspectival nature of and complexity of truth, taking note that in the encompassing truth is divided into its various modes of existence, consciousness in general, and spirit, and so I think uh, Jaspers nicely harmonizes the fact that truth is dependent on the lens uh, and purpose through which one investigates it. And there are multiple factors that contribute to what makes a particular act, claim, or method correct or useful. Yet, tensions amidst the exceptions and the authorities evident in particular truth claims also highlight the darker psychological and existential sides of epistemology. The fact that we knowingly and intentionally seek to avoid distressing or unsettling truths, as well as ideas that simply do not align with our own beliefs or preferences. So it's not a coincidence that inhabiting an ideological echo chamber goes hand in hand with the current fake news phenomena. So in this case then, appropriate dialogue partner with Jaspers is the French existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre, the champion of human freedom and responsibility particular in situations that cannot excuse our behavior, as Sartre would argue, but instead demand choices in the face of our current situation. So in daily life, existence and bad faith often accompany each other. Um, so my aim in this essay is to highlight the, uh, that along with our renewed and urgent sense of coming to grips with what is true, we must also recognize our tendency to, to avoid the truth for the sake of self-preservation, manipulation, or even self-deception. <clears throat> so Sartre actually never wrote uh, in a, a formal epistemology in his life, but after his death, uh, a manuscript surfaced that was published under the title Truth and Existence, which most scholars see as a response to Martin Heidegger's The Essence of Truth. But Sartre's analysis is less an epistemology and more an ontology of truth meant to address ethical issues surrounding freedom, action, and self-deception. So in short, Sartre offers us something more like an, uh, an ethics of truth. So in this short text, Sartre focuses on a French concept, ignorar, uh, which is a term that can mean on the one hand, just not knowing something, um, but on the other hand, can it be a sense of avoiding knowledge either through indifference or intention. So the English terms, for example, ignorance, and ignoring kind of capture this dual sense of what Sartre is getting at. Um, the, the, those two terms, ignorance and ignoring, actually have their roots in the French ignorar. Um, and so there's ignorance in the sense of just not knowing something, which is a condition of our existence that we can't avoid. Sartre will call this necessary ignorance. But ignorance in the sense of ignoring and avoiding truth, ignoring the truth, is a kind of willful ignorance which involves an intentional and volitional act on the part of the person. So in other words, Sartre focuses largely on what in English we would call ignoring the truth as a means to illuminate the ways in which we either intentionally or purposefully um, avoid or hide certain truths about ourselves and the world. So <clears throat> Sartre spends much then of this text discussing the internal links between uh, ignorance and knowledge, focusing most of his attention on willful ignorance and about the last quarter of the text on necessary ignorance. His driving aim is very similar to a lot of his other early psychological, psychological writings, if you know anything about Sartre, um, which is basically to shine light on the various realms of the human uh, and see them as act, uh, active expressions of human freedom. Um, so the question then basically for Sartre is, in my mind, is how does one move from the view that ignorance is the necessary condition of all knowledge 
to this idea that one chooses to ignore knowledge and reality altogether. Um, so Sartre locates this answer in anticipation. So as Sartre had argued in Being and Nothingness, human beings act towards what he says is not yet. Um, that is, our aims and goals transcend our realizing, sorry, they, excuse me, they, our aims and goals transcend towards realizing our projects, whether those be simple future states of being or our attempts to try to shape or manipulate future outcomes to suit our interests or objectives. So in that sense, anticipation is uh, revealed to us through our preferences and expectations. Okay, so then, according to Sartre, then, anticipation explains what makes error possible, as well as this distinction between necessary and willful ignorance. So what is error, according to Sartre? So for error, for Sartre, error is basically a negative verification of our anticipation. Uh, for example, I turn a saucer over and I see the back of it, now I verify the back of it, what it looks like, its existence and so forth, and then I put it back down, and now I've moved it from the realm of verification back to anticipation. Um, but now we call that knowledge because it's been verified through anticipation uh, and through a particular kind of observation. Of course, right, um, we can always return back to this anticipation. So for example, uh, I'm, I'm eating and I have a salt shaker sitting here and I put a little bit of salt on my food and I set it down and my friend next to me wants to play a joke and replaces the salt shaker with ex one that looks like the same but it's filled with sugar. And now I take the same thing, which I think, and I pour it on and suddenly I go taste my food and it tastes really weird and my anticipation has been all off. So, right, so the way Sartre puts this is um, as soon as we move from a stance of verifying our anticipation, then error becomes a permanent risk. Uh, so the task of verification then becomes circular and a continuous uh, process. So as a consequence, then one may choose to reject, this is where Sartre kind of moves to the more active mode, we can choose to reject the task of unveiling being to ourself through acts of consciousness, um, which according to Sartre contradicts our very existence, what he calls our upsurge in the world. So we cannot avoid unveiling reality, but we can avoid truth by refusing to anticipate certain possibilities, by denying what we observe, or by simply just wanting the world to be different than the way it actually is. So in short, the origin of ignorance, both our necessary ignorance and also our willful ignorance, is prolonged by choice and sometimes lying either to others or to ourself. At this point, then, Sartre brings in an example of a woman he simply calls T, who is uh, somebody who likely has tuberculosis but refuses to see the doctor. And so Sartre phrases this example as T's fear of truth is also the fear of her freedom as well. So once she decides not to consult the doctor, the woman, according to Sartre, is aiming to what he says minimize being, right? Because the, the, if we're trying to unveil being, then to minimize being is try to avoid uh, being all together. So in other words, the way, another way I start with this is that she's, she wants being to collapse. Uh, so now, but this is different from just refusing to understand. So in T's case, uh, Sartre says, her willed ignorance is not simply a refusal to understand or to see something. For instance, the way people just refuse to see something unpleasant they don't want to look at. Rather, the point is not to destroy being, but as Sartre points out, quote, to allow it to collapse in its night without intervening by leaving it all, leaving to it all responsibility for this annihilation. So then Sartre uses maybe perhaps an odd analogy at this point, but he says he compares the woman's actions to being like a person who allows her enemy to drown without attempting to save the enemy, as opposed to a person who directly just murders an enemy. So uh, murdering an enemy is epistemologically akin to simply just refusing to understand something unpleasant. Whereas T's actions are more like washing one's hands clean by claiming innocence. So as Sartre argues, it's not I who kills my enemy. He shouldn't have got into the boat. It's his own fault that he died and I washed my hands of it. In other words, um, ignorance through ignoring the truth is tantamount to letting being collapse. Uh, a contradiction of the very nature of consciousness as about something and about unveiling uh, being. So Sartre concludes then that ignorance is a project, is also a mode of knowledge, 
since if I want to ignore being, if I want to ignore being, that presumes that I affirm that it is actually is something that's knowable. So <clears throat> a common thread that goes through these various attempts of ours to evade truth is to place oneself in a stance of general indifference, Sartre says, to our future, what Sartre calls a denial of our transcendence or our ability to overreach uh, the facts that are true of us in order to realize our objects. So uh, in this case, uh, this could fit in with, uh, this is uh, typical of Sartre's uh, definitions of bad faith, where bad faith is either a denial of one's ability to transcend the facts or our ability to embrace what we've done, our facticity. So in this case, Sartre says, one can deny the role transcendence plays in our lives, for example, by engulfing oneself in other tasks, chores, or projects that make us unavailable or unable to face our responsibilities. So in T's case, going to the doctor. So fundamental to this way of evading the truth is conceptualizing these other tasks as taking some kind of preeminence, that is, as being essentially beyond and independent of our will. So to start, what this strategy amounts to is finding ways for T to prevent herself from going to the doctor. For instance, quote, she creates a value system which makes it important to go visit that friend, more important to go visit that friend, than to go and see the doctor, or instead she is too busy socially. She is not able to go to the doctor. She does not have the time. So if you know Sartre well, um, a lot of these things that we say to ourselves, I must do this, I can't do this, are actually more like, I choose not to, I don't want to, I don't have to, like, as opposed to actually being cases where we actually don't want to. And so, in short, while we often do not want to admit it to ourselves, we often utilize statements like I can't or I must as excuses for the fact that we actually could attend that friend's party, for example, uh, but that we value some other event or commitment <coughs> more. And so Sartre, in this case, I think, harshly reminds us that such decisions place no commitment or obligation completely out of the bounds of personal choice and responsibility, which include not just choices that we make, but also choices we do not make as a result of choosing one course of action over and against another. So unfortunately, because of the brevity of this uh, paper, I don't really quite have the time. I realized that my abstract ended up being a little ambitious. So I want to be able to talk about more also necessary ignorance and some of these other points, just simply don't have the time. And I also made other connections in connecting with Jaspers, but I realized if you know Jaspers well enough, you probably can see some of these connections, but just don't have time to get all this in into this paper. So to kind of conclude with where Sartre's going with this is, even in necessary ignorance, we're ignoring aspects of reality because we simply have to. Um, so we all ignore certain truths in order to realize others. As Sartre writes, quote, my truth appears on the ground of ignorance of innumerable other truths and the interiorization of my finitude or choice implies that I decide not to know in order to know, to not know the rest in order to know this. So the problem is not ignorance itself, <clears throat> which, is which is unavoidable, but rather the stance, one takes, the stance one takes towards reality, which will undoubtedly either reveal or conceal truths about ourselves and the world. So as sort of highlights, even our necessary ignorance is a product of our free capacity to choose, but the important consideration under investigation is the motivating factors for what we choose to believe and to ignore. And start pressures us to ask ourselves with integrity and sincerity why we believe what we actually believe. Um, so in this sense then, as I've been kind of trying to point out, is start concern is much less, as you can kind of see now, epistemological than ethical. So whatever Sartre has in mind concerning the nature of truth, he certainly sees truth as something that's directly just apprehended through the, this, this relationship we have with unveiling being. It's absurd to try to ignore the truth, as George Costanza recommends to Jerry Seinfeld or as T attempts to do. As Ronald Aronson, a well-known Sartre scholar, correctly claims, proof, if we may use that word, is based on good faith towards being the choice to see it. Therefore, it turns on the will to see being to refuse ignorance, and to take responsibility for what we have seen. Beyond this, no proof is necessary because truth depends on each individual's direct intuition of there is. Thank you. Thank you, Dane. Next up, we have uh, Jörn Kroll talking about Selbstrachelung beyond academia and the unexplored potential of philosophical education. 
In preparing for my following remarks, I was hard pressed to find Jasper's most relevant work for analyzing our current cultural and political situation in the United States. And for a long time, one book was my obvious choice, his 1913 General Psychopathology, still in print and now more needed than ever. However, instead of focusing on cultural pathologies, let's be constructive and be inspired by two lines from the poet Friedrich Hölderlin. Hölderlin was a close friend of Hegel and Schelling in uh, the Tübingen Seminary around 1800. In his long poem entitled Patmos, Hölderlin reminds us, wo aber Gefahr ist, wächst das Rettende auch. I translate the two lines as follows. But where there is danger, there grows the saving power as well. My remarks will focus on truth, communication, and free expression, primarily outside academia. And I use free expression as a little more general term than free speech in order to include action and art. To begin with, a minor point. Existenzerhellung can be used as a caption for Jasper's entire life work. We can translate existenzerhellung with clarification, elucidation, or illumination of human existence. I'm using in this presentation Selbsterhellung, illumination of the self by the self, in order to stress the needed efforts of each individual in the ongoing process of self-exploration. A more important, uh, important point, uh, a point that regards my main reason for my focus on cultural events outside the university. Having spent many years, probably too many, at the university, first in Germany, then at the University of California at Berkeley, it is my impression that most universities' humanities departments are lagging behind the pioneering experiential and experimental developments that I see in contemporary North American culture. This lagging behind is not necessarily the fault of those universities because they are hamstrung by countless federal and state regulations. Furthermore, universities are required to produce economic utility for society. Existenzerhellung, that is freewheeling intellectual curiosity and education for personal and collective freedom, are rarely the top objectives at universities, unfortunately. So, given the current university objectives, Jasper's idea of the university appears indeed utopian. However, several of Jasper's ideas are germinating today, I think mostly outside of academia. This multifaceted germinating doesn't always occur in the name of philosophy. If there is one term that I had to choose to describe this amorphous but growing cultural undercurrent, I would use transformation. More precisely, deliberate and dynamic transformation in thought and action. I see this transformation going on in various areas, in the general culture, in politics, environmental concerns, gender issues, and public safety as we have most vividly seen uh, regarding gun safety uh, last Saturday during the approximately 800 marches for our lives. We have heard from, from other speakers what philosophers can do to uh, improve the impact of philosophy in the public sphere. Uh, today, I just want to present some additional ideas of how philosophy can raise the level of our present political and public discourse and how it can be a stronger force in ongoing cultural transformation. 
To this end, I'm frequently borrowing from Jasper's work, in particular, his, his ideas on existential communication. And I just want to mention uh, three axioms which I find in Jasper's works regarding existential communication. First, the impossibility of truth, but the commitment to truthfulness. Jasper's emphasis on truth and truthfulness is very refreshing, given our current widespread truth decay. Second, disengagement from any objective a priori certainty about truth and the assumed essence of anything that exists. Third, the total will to communication. So what are the implications of these three axioms of ex existential communication? I would like to formulate it in the following way. The unconditional existential openness towards myself as a model for communication with others, as my existence is mirrored in the existence of others, or put into a different words, public communication in its genuine form is an extension of my self Selbsterhellung, my own personal existence erhellung. Or even shorter, be truthful to yourself as you are truthful with others. In order to make these more abstract axioms co concrete, I would like to re refer us to uh, two very important pages in his The Idea of the University, where he compares debate versus discussion. He lists several characteristics according to which he compares debate with discussion. The characteristics are set, what are the set principles? What do they do? Are there any? Second, criteria, what's the criteria for winning a debate or in a discussion? Who wins? What is the prevailing mood of discussion? And what are the results in each? Uh, because of time, I just want to go and sample two of these characteristics. In a debate, one person wins. A discussion is not a zero-sum game. There is no end. Nobody wins. Every principle discovered serves as a point of departure for new discussion. The result of the debate is a final break-off of communication. The result of discussion, on the other hand, is becoming suspicious of one's own rightness. Any conclusions reached serve a, only as stepping stones for further inquiry. The following main characteristics in, the, in what he calls discussion versus debate. We have openness, we have spaciousness, non-attachment to any particular outcome. And these three general characteristics are main characteristics of freedom. These principles of existential communication can be practiced and learned in philosophy at middle and high school and, as we heard, a philosophy for children. Um, many of the groups uh, which I know do philosophy in prison. There is philosophy, philosoph philosophical counseling as an alternative to psychotherapy as encouraged by the American Philosophical Practitioners Association, of which I am a member. Philosophy in medical settings, trauma centers, rehabilitation centers, and during end-of-life care. I want to alert you to a very inspiring book, which just uh, was published three weeks ago. It is called A New Republic of the Heart, an Ethos for Revolutionaries. 30 pages of that book deal with nothing but a listing of organizations, groups that foster the transformation I was alluding to. 
And again, uh, just because of time, I cannot read all the 13 categories according to which he lists those 200 groups or organizations. I just want to give a sample again. First, um, intelligence of the heart. Integral evolutionary resources. Convening transformational conversations and communities. Then we have transpartisan initiatives, for, so where people of different opposing political or cultural ideas or religious affiliations begin to talk and communicate with each other. So in conclusion, I have merely sketched the growing stream of cultural innovation. And it is worthwhile, I think, to look much closer at the activities of some of these groups and organizations. It is my goal, and I, hopefully, and I hope that many others will join, uh, in blending traditional love of wisdom, philosophy, with the urge for meaning, meaningful individual and cultural change. Therefore, let's be inspired by Hölderlin lines but where there is danger, there grows the saving power as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jörn. Um, so our final presenter for tonight will be uh, Ashraf Adil, speaking on a virtue theoretic approach to the concept of a university. I have just uh, five minutes at my disposal. So I have summed up the paper into uh, bullet points. I'm just trying to go, going to go through them quickly, and then, you know, if there's anything we can discuss, we will. Uh, firstly, there has been a big shift in epistemology recently from efforts to defining knowledge in terms of justified true belief and some condition that blocks get your style problem for such a definition. A lot of epistemologists have decided to focus on epistemic virtues as foundational and fundamental to epistemology. Uh, some use them for defining knowledge, like Zagzewski, but others simply try to understand them as foundational for our intellectual flourishing. Now, because of this shift to intellectual virtues, the question of value of knowledge has received new attention. Some epistemologists like Kavanweg and Pritchard have come to the conclusion that it is not propositional, atomistic propositional knowledge, but holistic understanding as an epistemic state that is finally valuable. Understanding for some of these epistemologists is holistic, like understanding of a person or understanding a discipline like physics, etc., or understanding a certain art. Now, this is obviously a contrast from a atomistic propositional uh, definition where individual propositions are our focus and we try to define what knowledge of an individual proposition consists in. And that is normally done in terms of justified true belief plus a condition which blocks the Gettier style problem, which was introduced in 1963 by Edmund Gettier, and which has become, you know, uh, a, a huge issue for epistem uh, contemporary epistemology. We yet do not know how to address that problem. Now, Karl Jaspers believes that uh, the ultimate goal of a university is to pursue science both in its broad sense of being methodical cogent and universally valid knowledge, and in the narrow sense of methodical research to discover truth about the objective world. Now, this science, when combined with philosophy, which is an effort to understand the nature of being in the world for man, yields what Jaspers calls comprehensive, lucid self-knowledge. Now, such comprehensive self-knowledge appears to be different than at a mystic propositional knowledge and is more akin to, you know, what epistemologists have called holistic understanding. Therefore, the goal of education, according to both Jaspers and contemporary epistemologists, seems to be attainment of such a holistic understanding 
of man in the world through pursuit of science and philosophy. And ultimate unification of sciences as well. Now, virtue epistemologists argue that virtue epistemology, when applied to education, would, would aim at developing the epistemic character of a student. According to virtue epistemologists, generally, epistemic character involves three things. Epistemic faculties, epistemic abilities, and epistemic or intellectual virtues. Epistemic faculties like perception, memory, reason, etc. are natural but can be sharpened through education and training. Epistemic abilities like being able to calculate sums, etc. are acquired and have instrumental value only. Epistemic virtues like, the intellectual, like, like intellectual conscientiousness, for example, are valuable for their own sake and play both a reflective and regulative role in our intellectual flourishing. Now, obviously, a lot of the basic epistemic abilities and skills as well as intellectual virtues need to be taught at the school level. Such instruction and training at the school level is foundational. However, higher abilities to conduct inquiry in any field and to conduct it in an intellectually conscientious manner are to be inculcated by the university. Therefore, in so far as inquiry is the only way through which we generate knowledge and understanding of nature and society, the central role of a university is twofold, to produce conscientious inquirers and to produce practitioners who can use the fruits of inquiry for wholesome socio-economic growth and flourishing. Now, the formal role, however, is more basic because without innovative conscientious inquiry, there can be no fruits of inquiry to be put into practice. This is what Karl Jaspers underscored, underscored when he argued that the future of our universities lies in the renewal of their originative spirit. Now, this originative spirit can be achieved according to contemporary epistemologists uh, by trying to give students a holistic understanding of our position, man's position, man, a holistic understanding of man as well as his position in nature and history. And that, I think, is an overlap, philosophical overlap between Jasper's idea of, it, of the university and contemporary epistemology. Thank you. Thank you, Ashraf. Uh, okay, so with the time remaining, we'll open it up for q and A. If anybody would like to come up, if you could please come to the chair and take the mic. I have a, I have a question actually for, for, for you, Dan, and that is, um, so you've, you've described uh, Sartre's um, you know, understanding of people who, who deliberately, you know, in some sense, hide the truth from themselves. Um, but is this exactly the same so it, it seems that there's also a class of, of people or a class of, of, of uh, an attitude to the, towards the truth in which it's not even so much an active fleeing from the truth or, or minimizing being, but just a, an absence of any relationship to the truth. It's not like a, a self-deception. I mean, self-deception you know, requires the idea that, that, there, you know, that it matters whether you have tuberculosis or not. But what about the sort of like, kind of like bullshit idea of... of of just no relationship at all it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. Is it, does do you think that Sartre's basically does Sartre's uh, analysis still apply to to to, to bullshit and, and bullshitters? Do you have in mind the the Harry Frankfurt yeah. notion? Of them? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, I I would have to imagine that Sartre would be just as harsh with uh, with with bullshitting as as he would be. With somebody who's lying or or just trying to evade the truth, um, <clears throat> so yeah, you're right. I mean, there's this active fleeing but not caring. Um, I, typically, I'd probably say that like yeah, not even caring about the truth at all, making it up as you go, um, is probably just as much of fleeing from one's responsibility as any other act. Um, you know, right? Because I mean, Cassart will he has 
he, he'll put in even seemingly like good emotions into possibilities of like fleeing from responsibility, like falling in love. You, know, you think about things that people sometimes do when they fall in love. They, they throw off all their responsibilities and right and they do things they normally would never do whether it's like staying out late or just not taking care of things and and sometimes like so like there's lots of or or you can imagine somebody's just really good mood but it's actually even um a little obnoxious because they're like the good news is, is trying to avoid um cases of of not facing like actual suffering that someone might have or that that kind of thing so yeah i mean i think uh he'd probably be just as harsh um, with BS or BSing or that stance towards the world in terms of just not caring about unveiling being because we actually still are doing it in general. I actually thought your question was going to be more just like people that are just ignorant and wouldn't know. But yeah, I, th I, th I think he would be just as, as harsh in that situation as I think as well too. So this is a question for Jorn. Um, you know, I think there, there is definitely precedent for... Um, innovative forms of thought and practice emerging outside of the university. I think the two most prominent examples relate directly to the foundation of existentialism itself with Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. Um, but I get the sense that you're also talking about uh, not necessarily philosophers or sort of path-breaking thinkers who are operating outside of the university, but more sort of groups of people within which certain patterns of formation can, can take shape, um, which would be sort of the function that historically religion has played uh, in human society, being outside of the university, um, but also being a central place in which inquiry, formation, uh, sort of all sorts of, uh, sorts of um, transformation take place as well. So I guess in that regard, uh, maybe just to specify sort of are these organizations that you're talking about, are they sort of playing the role of, of sort of vaguely secularized religions? Um, are they sort of the space in which spirituality is being deployed, but in the language of kind of group or organization or conference? Um, and if so, does, does that matter? Um, is it significant? Is it something different altogether? Um, I just, yeah. As I mentioned in my presentation, what this group have in common is commitment to a core philosophy. Many philosophers may not consider it philosophy, but they want to put it in practice, socially yeah. and in terms of uh, the goodness of environment, in go go uh, for peace, and, and so on. So it's, it's certainly true that uh, religion plays a role in them, but it, it changes again from very committed to a very loose, loose commitment. So I cannot say any, anything more than that. This is a bit of an unfair question because I want to exploit all your expertise <laughs> because this, this question haunted me as I was reading and or you know familiarizing myself with Jasper's works. He says somewhere, I think in the idea of the university, that the mass is hostile to excellence. So um, on, the, on the one hand, he seems to be, you know, creating this utopian university uh, for communication and search for truth. But then he does have a chapter, I think, on like how we're going to select the people who are, you know, properly to be part of this institution. And when we want to talk about you know, opening education up to the public and incorporating more and more parts of the population, um, how how do we square this? <laughs> is is the mass by nature hostile to excellence? And like, how how do we bring the Socratic necessary ignorance and you know fight the? <laughs> I mean, I could bring it all to you. I think it connects to to your thoughts. But so here we go. For our culture to progress, we have to have both. We have to have tradition and we have innovation, and they play an interesting you know dialectical game with each other. So it's important um, for, the for the mass to be tolerant of experiments without giving up whatever tradition the mass is currently enjoying at a particular time. There are you know, studies which show that group wisdom is generally uh, more acute and higher than individual wisdom. And uh, even in you know, practical situations where a plan has 
you know, shattered into into the sea, and they wanted to locate the spot. It was, you know, through collecting the general w- wisdom of the society about where it might have fallen that they were able to discover it. There are such instances. So, uh, group wisdom, uh, if Jasper was sort of trying to underestimate the acuteness of uh, group wisdom, uh, that I think is uh, something that that is questionable. But uh, uh, if he had something else in mind, which I'm not sure what he had in mind, maybe uh, uh, you know some of the experts could help. But uh, uh, that's another thing. I I think that uh, ultimately society is not sustained by the intellectual elite, but the wisdom of the group. And that's why democracy has survived in human history and is flourishing. That's a fantastic question. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I kind of would like to say um, there's maybe some, some truth in it, but, but it isn't an outright uh, connection to it. For me, I think it's less a hostility to excellence, but I think probably just a more attention in, in, in excellence between different competing values that we have in our culture uh, as of now. And so, for example, um, America began, right, kind of this, uh, kind of the 19th century, but part of the Second Great Awakening, this move away from what was education at the time, which would have been more like rare today, private tutoring and private, private education to a universal public school system, right? And that was like an experiment. I mean, that was a really radical experiment to do uh, with, with the premise that if we're going to have a full functioning, well-developed democracy and republic, that uh, we have to have a well-educated citizenry. And you know, here we are now where we have, in a way, more people going to college in America than ever have, right? Um, and yet, at the same time, I, will, I certainly will recognize that, um, that there is a sense of anti-intellectualism in our culture in various ways, as, uh, as he was just uh, like alluding to. Um, and sometimes I think it's a matter of uh, the competing values and how we're going to define excellence. Because I imagine um, excellence can be understood in excellence in lots of different areas as well, too. And I'm sure, so I'm, I imagine it depends on like if we might think people aren't living up to our expectations, but they're living up to their family's expectations, or they're living up to a community's expectations, or they're living up to other kinds of expectations they might consider excellent. But the question that I, and I think that Yasper's posed nice well is what kind of values are we going to do in conscientiousness and some of these other virtues, I think are good things for us to be thinking about. So I would say more attention as opposed to hostility. Um, but yeah, but I, I think it's an excellent question. Uh, as the sociologist in the room, I wanted to point to the class structure of Germany in the years in which Jaspers led most of his pre-war, pre-Nazi era career, and in which Almost all the faculty, not not everybody, but the great preponderance, were from uh, upper class, wealthy families. Jaspers was himself supported by his father until he became ordinarius. Uh, Max Weber uh, was supported by his family until uh, his wife's wealth, her family wealth, supported the family. Uh, my grandfather, Carl Vilmontz, was uh, a, a professor of psychiatry at Heidelberg in the same period, and he was supported by his family's wealth as a m- wealthy merchant family. Uh, uh, the funds to build the rather grand house on the Bergstrasse that my grandfather and grandmother uh, built uh, was um, loaned to him by his younger brother, who had part of the patent on the first color film, and had gotten very wealthy as a fairly young man, as a chemist. Uh, but it ran through the, the, the faculty as a whole that they were uh, educated in a very elite manner and uh, were supported 
by family wealth and with a kind of family solidarity where there was a willingness to support uh, somebody who was going to play a leading role in the educational and in the research system uh, of the institute of the society and they were also a very small group uh, in uh, pre-nazi germany three to four percent of a cohort gained university education uh, so it was a, a a small group and those who proceeded to faculty appointments and so on uh, were a, a much smaller group within that and most of them had, had to go through the period of being uh, lecturers who could get some fee for their lectures but did not have a salary and unless they were extraordinarily popular didn't earn a living I think it's intriguing what Jasper's position was historically about this, particularly after the Second World War. And maybe it's helpful to remember that at the time when he was asked to write a letter with respect to what should do, be done with Heidegger in the denazification proceedings, what Jasper said was, well, heavens, allow him his personal library and his books and his opportunities to write because this man is actually a philosophical genius, however controversial. But do not give him teaching privileges. That is because of how deeply persuasive he has turned out to be. But now, relative to what we've been talking about this evening very recently, uh, he claims that the current generation of uh, German students, as well as their parents and before that, uh, uh, weren't typically gifted at thinking critically, uh, weren't terribly good at thinking for themselves. And given that alleged uh, propensity to uh, follow on what sounds like some combination of order and uh, powerful suggestion, uh, they're likely to uh, uh, not develop this critical capacity. So now this is really speculation. If you have the university as Jaspers thinks of it, what you're going to have is not one figure of amazing, uh, uh, persuasive, and nearly hypnotic capacity. You're going to have a consortium of people that are in a kind of multilogue something one step beyond the dialogue with each other. And I wonder if that was the sort of thing that uh, in part engendered some of his thinking. It's also obvious that, you know, he was, uh, I just want to add that uh, he uh, was speaking to various issues in terms of the, uh, you know, perspective, epistemological perspective in which he was grounded. And, uh, the existentialism and uh, phenomenolo phenomenological tradition obviously uh, uh, does not have uh, the same kind of uh, focus on uh, uh, epistemic concepts, epistemic virtues, uh, and uh, uh, epistemic goals uh, or epistemic states of human beings uh, as uh, let us say, the contemporary uh, epistemology, analytic epistemology has. So there has to be uh, some kind of, a, if you like, reinterpretation of Jaspers. And some of the remarks might be uh, in, uh, placed in, in the contemporary context of epistemology and views of understanding and knowledge and uh, epistemic virtues uh, might be diff um, interpreted completely differently. Uh, the, I mean, for example, when he talks about uh, the moss and uh, says that, you know, they, they, they may not have the right kind of epistemic capacities, uh, this, you know, sort of flies, uh, this, con this is a conflict with the testimonial knowledge upon which our lives depend. We have to trust each other and uh, for almost everything. 
Now, if you don't have the right kind of uh, epistemic concept in relation to the significance of testimony, which, uh, which uh, sort of sustains our lives in society, uh, you can then say that, yes, uh, the mass uh, cannot play a significant role. But basically, society or university is ultimately sustained by this value of trust as well as testimony as a form of knowledge. And uh, probably when we shift some of his ideas it, to the contemporary context, we will have to reinterpret them. So that's, that's a, just a footnote that I wanted to add to what you said. Thank you. As, as you know, uh, later in his life, uh, Jaspers wrote um, pol political books, uh, not party politics, but he put his attention for instance, on, on the dangers of the at atom bomb, and he wrote a, a book which was quite controversial, um, talking about or asking where does the Federal Republic of Germany is drifting to. Um, and that caused him uh, quite a lot of criticism. <coughs> I, <coughs> I, I wish he would have stayed in Germany rather than going to northern Switzer Switzerland, just across the, the border uh, to Basel, and uh, sort of fighting it out. I don't know what uh, convinced him to go to Switzerland. Um, maybe, he, he, maybe he was tired of fighting, and uh, he had definitely more private peace in, in Basel, Switzerland, rather than as if he had stayed in, in, in Heidelberg, and he would have had a lot of fights on, on his hand. That's, that's my speculation. But I find it very interesting to see that towards the end of his life, he did not really become a political activist, but he, rather than individual existence, the existence of society became his uh, main, main focus. Something, something I didn't get to say in my presentation, but I had in my paper for time constraints, was um, some of the things that Hart talks about are some of the, the ways in which uh, we engage in willful ignorance, like certain kinds of strategies that we employ. And, um, but beginning on, like, on, the, on the necessary ignorance part, as we were saying, like, the, the trustworthy sources, the testimony of where things are coming from, I think is, is like, like one of these big issues. And as, like, well, a lot of people are talking about the effect that things like fake news had on the uh, November 16 election and, and the election of Trump, people are still debating about this. But one of the things that you would, like people generally do not disagree on is fake news is bad, right? I mean, even if, even if um, certain groups uh, claim that like even like real news is fake news, like they, they recognize that fake news is bad. So you think that's not the controversy, right? Like the the so you would think like can't we just get rid of it? But the problem is as like we're talking about and even Jaspers connects with, with with you know dividing truth into these these different modes is truth is complicated. Right, and so you have this sense of like, it's 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 a philosophical problem, even of trying to get rid of fake news in a way, because, um, <clears throat> because you know, one, it's it's like sometimes stories get like part of it right, but then other things are just wrong, and then so they can manipulate and move it, um, or just because people don't agree with it, they flag it as like fake news and these kinds of things. So I I become kind of increasingly concerned about like the the soundbite consumption that we have of like all this information too in relation to the university education. Because, um, because like the news and, and, and other things like often become modes of not so much informing our beliefs, um, but like confirming our beliefs or, or having a hostile attitude towards truth. So Sartre highlights that there's like kind of these, these different modes of distraction, right? So you can just be passive and kind of not want to, a no, maybe a BS or even actually could fit into that. Um, but another mode that I think is related to ours is like distraction. Right? And just like finding ways to distract yourself with other things. And I think that's while technology can bring us information really quickly, it gives us an easy avenue for distraction too, where then we don't have to really do this, this, uh, this critical thinking or this uh, a consumption of, of information in a way that like really is the goal of what it seems like Jaspers and other people are trying to aim at for the university education. Um, 
And and so and I'm honest, like I'm not sure like what the answer to that is, but it seems like there like we have to be, be doing something to try to be working through like what is going to be a response to this, like how are we going to nurture, get back to these questions of openness, inquiry, debate, in such a way that it's not just who wins the debate, who loses, but this open endedness in 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 bringing uh, clarity to have a kind of intellectual epistemic virtues that we're bringing to the table. Um, and uh, I think we've definitely lost some of that. So while on the one hand we have more people who are going to college than ever, we have this problem that we're dealing with, and yet you would think we would be better than we ever are. And I'm not so sure, I'm not cynical, but, but certainly feel a little bit confused and, and disappointed and frustrated by where we are currently now as well, so. I just want to add a line here that, you know, uh, from Bacon on, we, uh, particularly modernity, uh, sort of, uh, took this idea to heart that knowledge is power, which meant that, you know, try to control things around, which ultimately in other times means that you know, try to control people through misinformation and fake news. Mm -hmm. So this view that knowledge is somehow ultimately connected with power and control is probably responsible for I mean, you remember Socrates said that knowledge is virtue. Knowledge was connected with virtue rather than with power and control. And there needs to be a shift now in our educational system from, uh, you know, s school onwards up to the university uh, towards inculcating, uh, you know, epistemic intellectual virtues in a comprehensive fashion in our, uh, in our uh, citizenry. And obviously, I mean, yes, there are more college-educated people in our country today, but then you can see that the political divide today is between mostly, or in, in broad general lines, if you are speaking in rough terms, uh, between the college-educated on the one hand and those who, have, who haven't been exposed to, you know, uh, college education. And, so, so we mean we need to expose the entirety of our citizenry to college education, university education, hopefully ultimately, and do so in such a way that virtues, intellectual virtues, epistemic virtues are inculcated in their character. And knowledge is not seen as a way of, uh, you know, manipulating the citizenry but rather as a way of opening up their hearts to truth and to each other. Uh, well, we will close for today then. Um, thank you all for your um, enlightening talks and for all of you that are here attending as well as uh, through YouTube. So thank you again. Thank you.